Hi, good afternoon everyone. I think the conversations have been candid and this round I hope will be candid as far as scaling up is concerned, like Shivani pointed out there. And uh, I think most ventures deal with this. You begin a venture, you start up, and then how do you scale up? What are the challenges that you encounter? Uh, you know, how does the culture of an organization changes when you scale up? You know the names of the first 50. How do you name, know the names of the next 500? Does it matter to know or not to know? What, are, what is the role that the founders play? Do investors need to be patient? What is it that if you have an impatient investor? So all of that, and I hope to cover some of that over the next 30 minutes, and then we'll of course open it for questions. Uh, uh, I think the panel has already been introduced, so let's just go headlong into this. So thanks to each one of you for being with us right here. Uh, and I think this is a question that one grapples with all the time, that you start a venture, and then how do you scale up? And I think our panel has a very good mix. We've got an early stage investor, we've got a late stage investor. We've got somebody who's done a startup, made it very successful, and is now an investor, can be a mentor of sorts. And then, of course, we've got someone who's done a startup, has scaled up, and so we've got to talk about the challenges. Sanjeev, let's begin with you. What is the biggest challenge that you have seen in achieving scale? And if I may actually ask you, what was most challenging about scaling up Nokri? Uh, well, actually, you know, uh, when you're in the thick of things, you don't uh, enumerate. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. When you're thick of things, you don't really enumerate, okay, I've got 14 challenges, let me see how to overcome them. You know, that's all hindsight, right? Uh, so if I look back and, uh, you know, we raised, we launched Nokri 97, bootstrap for three years, raised venture capital in 2000. Uh, and uh, we got lucky, the market melted down, we raised money just before the meltdown, so we didn't have time to spend it foolishly. Uh, we just put it in the bank and said, now what do we do? So. Until then, we were selling through direct mail. Uh, there was no online payment gateway, uh, you know, and our most expensive product was 6,000 rupees a year. Uh, and we were doing 3 lakhs a month of revenue. And uh, we said, okay, what do we do now? And uh, we began five or six experiments. Uh, one of the experiments was, uh, let's uh, hire a few salespeople and let them go out into the field uh, and sell to clients and uh, let's see what happens. So from direct mail, we began to put our toe in the water on, on field sales. And what we discovered was that uh, the average salesperson would generate, in three months' time, was generating 50,000 rupees a month of sales, when the total cost uh, you know, uh, was uh, 22,000 rupees, which is salary, conveyance, uh, variable pay, uh, office rent, uh, depreciation allocated, cost of laptop allocated, all that, 22,000. So the average salesperson was now generating a 28,000 rupees surplus every month and headed north. Right? And we said, hey, this is cool. Let's keep on adding salespeople till the last salesperson does not recover his or her own cost. And uh, that's when you say market is saturated. And we moved from zero salespeople to uh, two. 230 salespersons in about two and a half years' time across nine offices uh, around the country. And we broke even at uh, 30 times the revenue we were doing uh, before we raised, had raised venture capital. The point I'm making is that we had discovered uh, by accident, by experimentation, by learning, by doing, uh, our repeatable profitable unit. Mm -hmm. So if you can, if you're addressing a large enough market, first of all, to scale, you have to have a large enough market. If you have a product that people want, you know, then you don't have to try too hard to scale, right? And then if you discover your repeatable profitable unit, right, that's when you can scale. So Nokri scaled because we discovered our repeatable profitable unit. Uh, and to all startups trying to scale or ho hoping to scale or intending to scale, if you can discover your repeatable profitable unit uh, in whatever manner, right, and then you keep on scaling that, uh, that's when you achieve scale. Now, to do all this, of course, you need the right product, you need to be in a good market, technology, people, finance, resources, everything. But find your repeatable, profitable unit. So the mantra for you was to find the repeatable, profitable unit, and of course, uh, it goes unsaid, you have to find a product that the market wants, that way there is demand. So, Shuchi, was your experience similar in terms of finding that repeatable, profitable you know, I remember the first, uh, uh, first Diwali, we just launched Lime Road, and everybody was going uh, crazy with these discounts and big discounts on, on clothing. And I just, I had returned uh, from England, 17 years in England. I called up uh, Avneesh Bajaj of Matrix was on my board. 
And I said, Ravnish, I just don't get this. Everybody is discounting. What do they think will happen after Diwali and what do they think will happen during Diwali? Uh, is every woman going to buy her entire wardrobe in Diwali? No. Uh, it, is it a pan-India phenomenon? No. Uh, and then what happens in November and December and January and every other month? Can they keep discounting? No. Do you think I'm nuts? I'm not going to discount. And you know, those were some of the best decisions we made. And it, it came out of foolhardiness. But I think for us, our repeatable, profitable unit was the fact that we had a very simple thing. You had to make money on every trade. Every product sold at Lime Road had to make money. And we were contribution margin positive from day one. Uh, that was important to us. Uh, and we stuck by that. Now, what did we need to do to scale despite that? We just need to create what we wanted to create, which is a great discovery experience for our users. And so we just built a great product. And today, it, of course, uh, converts at 15% uh, to GMV and so on and so forth, which is the highest in the country. The point I'm trying to make is I think the biggest thing entrepreneurs should do is to find, of course, that repeatable, profitable unit, but that can continue to repeat in a very sustainable way. And to do that, often there is a huge trade-off between what I call short-term levers and long-term levers. And I think the, the thing to do is to cut out the noise in the market and focus only on your users and on what you truly believe is a long-term lever. I, that's what I would do. So your short-term lever was to go in for a discount that you didn't go in for. Your long-term lever was to create an experience and have a footfall. That yeah, and you know, in the last two and a half years, we grew 10x. Right. And you know, we think we, we can do that again for the next three years. So. Fair point. Uh, but Neeraj, I'm going to ask you as an investor, and I'll also have a chance to that question. Uh, as an investor, while you know, scale is relative, how do you know that the venture that you've invested in uh, is, is leveraging its best potential, is working to its maximum potential, is maximizing potential. Really. So let's begin with you and then, let's begin with Arsha actually and then come to you. Sure, go ahead. You know, I think there are standard things that all of us look at in terms of whether the market is large enough, uh, whether you have unique insight uh, for that. I think unique insight that Suchi had was to build a very interesting user experience on the product. The unique experience that uh, in Nokri was really first time bringing this to India and making it work for the Indian user, whether it's online or offline. So I think the unique insight is, I think that's really important because that's what differentiates you compared to the competition. Um, the third important thing are really teams. Uh, and I think these, everybody talks about it. Uh, I'll give some specific uh, annotation to that. I think the team that builds the business from uh, till the first million dollars of revenue is substantially different, at least on the sales side, than that takes it forward uh, to scale it from one to 10. It's very, very difficult when you have no proof points to show in the market and, and make the sales. So we find that many, many of these sales are founder led because the customer sees the passion uh, from the founder and really sees uh, the vision and really buys the vision in the product as opposed to it being commercial. Once you achieve that traction and you have proof points that you can show, then it's easier for the product to go ahead uh, beyond the initial, uh, you know, initial mark to, to at least some sort of growth, which is what Suchi has seen for our product. So I think getting it from uh, no customers to the first set of 10 customers will be the hardest and then follow that up with the right set of people who will take it from a particular base to whether it's a 3x or, or 4x growth from there on. So that's the perspective and the insight from an early stage investor. Let's hear from you. I mean, when, when, when you get in, that's a late stage investment. How do you determine that the startup or the business that you're investing in or the entity that you're going to put your moolah in is really maximizing their potential? See, I think one, one obvious reality is that the business plan you start out with is unlikely to be the business plan you end up with, right? So I, I think when we talk about companies scaling up, it's not necessarily true that everything has moved linearly uh, upwards to the right. So in that context, uh, you know, what Sanjeev said is identifying what is the unit economic model which is working and, in, and having the, uh, and we're a later stage investor, so looking from a later stage perspective, having the, the MIS and the data to continue to mine what you're doing and figure out whether the unit economic model remains the same and whether you can scale that profitably is important. 
I think second point is to Varsha's point, you know, hiring a team and building out that team is important. The question is how you do it, because the founder who's built the business is still the engine of growth. You don't want to lose that culture uh, and that energy which comes from there. At the same time, you want to hire a qualified team uh, which has the same vision for the company. So I think that becomes the second point which, which we look at at the later stage. Uh, I think the third is the role of inorganic and the role of acquisitions, right? Ten companies, a lot of them which have grown up from an early stage and succeeded, tend to still view strategically just organic growth. Uh, once you have access to capital at a later stage, the inorganic opportunities also open up. So those are the three dimensions where, when I look at later stage companies, especially those which have come up from a startup phase, it's the, it's the building out of the team, uh, whether they've, they've done that successfully, the, le the quality of the data they have in the MIS, and then the third is the ability to uh, consummate M&A transactions. You know, while we are, to you want to add to that? Because while we are talking about this, I'll take a cue from what he said. He spoke about founders, and I thought I'll come a little later in that discussion, but let's go into it. Um, how do you ensure, and because you've done that, and you were on the other side also in terms of investors, how do you now ensure that a founder is also scaling up with the organization? I mean, and, and I'm going to come to investors also on that. Uh, is that challenging to kind of determine if he is and if he's not? Because if he's not, then you've got to get an external talent, but do the comp does the company stay the same? See, we invest behind founders. Good founders pursuing great ideas. Uh, and the founder aspect, I think, is key. You know, if you look at globally, uh, over the last 20 years, which are the companies that were once startups and now are great companies, uh, a very, I, I can't think, I can think of only very few, I can't think of even one where the founders are still, are not, have been replaced by professional CEOs. If you look at Google, you look at Facebook, I mean, great companies are a product of a lifetime's work, often of great founders, sometimes of professional CEOs. And therefore, I, I'm not so sure that a founder who can take it from zero to one million is not the same guy who can take it from 10 million, who can, not the same guy who can take it from 100 million. I think the founder has to adapt. I think the founder should already have had many of the traits. I mean, the biggest trait is that can he, is he a magnet for talent, personally? Can he attract, can he or she attract great people to work with him or her? Right? Does he create trust across the table? Right? And this is stuff that, you know, some of it you are betting on that he might be able to do it. Uh, some of it you can assess early on, but a lot of it is a bet that, you know, this guy has never run a team earlier of more than five people. Uh, can he handle a team of 5,000? I don't know. But you're, you're taking a bet. But, you know, if that bet doesn't come off, uh, it's very rare, at least in India, to see a founder being replaced by a professional CEO and that company succeeding. Do you agree with that, Neeraj? And Varsha, I want to come in with you on this. I, I think, uh, as Sanjeev was saying, some founders scale, some founders don't scale, right? So uh, how do you make that determination? The examples on both sides, right? There's some very obvious examples of founders who didn't scale and destroyed companies, and there are lots of examples of founders who scaled. So I think one is you can't shy away from the actual financial and operating metrics the company's delivering on. Those are good proof points, right? And there's, you know, to Suchi's point, there's customer churn, there's management churn, there's the ability to attract good people. And so you have to look at that objectively. So I think a founder who's able to do that in my mind, as a founder who scales. Uh, I, I think the second point I look at is, does the founder have a vision for what is going to come down in the next six, 12 months, right? Uh, the success of any CEO or a good management team is, can you future predict what is going to happen and build your business for that today, right? And some can do that, some cannot. So that's the second point we look at. The third is, I guess, an obvious point, but someone who's willing to learn, right? Whether it's through an investor, through a mentor, someone who's open to the feedback, you don't necessarily always have to agree. But if you're not even open to a discussion, uh, then I think it becomes very difficult for anyone to scale. Do you come across founders like that more often than not? It's, it's a mixed bag, right? I, th I think, you know, you self-select into, at the latest stage, into investing behind people who obviously are open to the feedback. But you come across a lot of people who are not, right? And, and they, it doesn't mean they're not successful, but by and large, if you looked at a un, a sub, uh, the sample set of those guys, I'm pretty sure they're not successful long term. Fair point. But, you know, there's also statistics, and, and some of the greatest companies are where founders have stayed on, like Sanjeev said. Varsha, will you agree that... Uh, and I'm going to take upon this point that we were having this off chat with before we walked in here. And Suchi mentioned, as a lead, you've got to learn to morph. Uh, and if you don't do that, you cannot scale up. Uh, how much will you agree with this? I think I, I, I agree with that. Um, I think the passion of a business comes from the founding team most of the time because they lived and breathed it. You know, I'm sure you lived the, the business. 
and have strong passion. So I think uh, to have that energy around, it's wonderful that you have the continuity. Uh, you also need to be able to have complementary teams. So if you think that you cannot scale in particular areas, if you can attract the right sort of people, it balances out the execution uh, of the company. But having that, you know, that energy of, of, of founding teams alive uh, through the journey, along with uh, some sort of complementary teams, and like I mentioned, your teams will change over time. Uh, we cannot afford, as a startup, I, I think, his companies can afford fat paychecks where we can't afford them, right? And so we will hire people uh, who can get us to a particular stage. And then as we scale and as we get more capital, uh, we will be able to afford better management or people who can scale uh, to the next level. So I think it's a morphing game as you start from seed stage to early stage investing to, to later stage. And you just have to adapt uh, through the process, but keep the dream and, and the spirit really alive. In the and Sushit, would you agree that the dream and the spirit can be kept alive by a by a founder alone, or like Sanjeev said, you know, seldom have companies succeeded and gone on to become the iconic stories with leaders in transition. It, it never really translates. I, I think, you know, uh, I have to say this, you know, as a founder, uh, as a first time entrepreneur, uh, it's shit scary to see your company go from the, from 1 million to 10 million to 100 million to beyond. and and if you have, you know, founders have to be uh, somewhat uh, crazy uh, and somewhat, um, you know, disbelieving of reality, which is true. Uh, but uh, I think you need to be uh, continuously introspecting because uh, whether you get to your next milestone or not is a function of really two things. It's a function of you and your impact people you've brought on board and are going to bring on board, and two, your ability to make great decisions at least most of the time. You're not going to get them right, but all the time, but great decisions most of the time. And so I think if anybody looks deep in, it is shit scary, uh, but that's good. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, I think Paul Ochilani, or Andy Grove always used to say, right, the paranoid uh, survive. I, I think, I think, and Entrepreneurs need to be paranoid a little bit. But I think having said that, I agree with what Neeraj said, right? It's learning. I mean, we, we're, we're I think you have to be crazy and you have to be dismissive of what you don't believe, but you have to be learning. And part of that learning is listening. And so the most important thing that I would say um, to you, Supriya, is that, you know, we have to listen because if we are blindsided and we don't know we are blindsided, I think that is the recipe for, for disaster. So I think, I think that, that would be what I'd say. So on that very scary paranoia note, let me ask you, Sanjeev, what is the biggest challenge? The transition of talent, the transition of culture, but at the same time keeping the DNA intact? I mean, how tough is that? I'm sure when you started off, you'd know the name of the first 50 people in your organization. It's tough to know the first 500. So first, you know, how many of us are doing uh, startups here? Uh, it's okay. Well, if you're in the right? house. <laughs> it's okay. So first of all, uh, you know, don't, over, don't overthink this culture thing and don't overthink this transition thing. Just do your work. Okay? That's what we did. We didn't overthink anything. So we did not have a culture strategy. We probably still don't have a culture strategy. Uh, I don't know what a culture strategy is. If you ask me to define culture, I don't know what, what to say. Uh, you know, just do your work. Uh, be good to people. Be good to your customers. Tell the truth. Build trust across the table. Ho jayega. Okay? Number one. Uh, number two, you know, all this transition that people talk about, you know, zero to one million, one to ten million, ten to hundred million, beyond, or, you know, uh, zero to five hundred employees, zero to fifty employees, whatever, uh, that's all in hindsight and there, there are no compartments. Right? You keep on working every day and things happen. Okay? When you look back, somebody else might tell you, hey, you know, this is your culture. That's fine, yeah. That's our culture. Great. Move on. Yeah. So, so we don't overthink it. <laughs> Those are words to swear by. My someone who did go from. Well, we, we, we are now we are now uh, almost 4,000 employees. Uh, and look, up to the first thousand employees, uh, the entrepreneur has to be the glue in the organization to retain the good people, to attract good talent. But beyond thousand people, and there was me and Hitesh, so two of us had to do it. It's, if you're one person, then it's you know probably much smaller. 
right? Uh, but beyond that, you've got to have other leaders, second level, third level processes, all of that. You've got to build your brand. You've got to do stuff for employees where it's beyond your personal connect, right? But if you're not there yet, don't worry. When you get there, then you start worrying, right? Right now, do your work. So culture and talent, according to you, is more of a hindsight learning that most people yes, do. No, 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 when no, no. when you that's, that's, that, that, yeah. uh, no, that's what happened to that's what happened to us, uh, and that's what we did. I'm not saying that's the only way. I'm sure the other ways, uh, but humko ye hua. Okay, so we'll, we'll get our differing opinion from Suji before I move. No, on actually, to I I I I'm loving what Sanjeev is saying. I don't think I was. Uh, we started like that. We, we actually made a list of the things we, uh, the, the characteristics of a place we love to work at. And that was, uh, that was there, that Just was on day one. And we said, what is a place where we'd want to come every day in the morning with a, with a, a skip and a jump and really what's the place that every one of us, including that office boy, will feel like an owner. Uh, and we, we wrote down four things, and it's on the wall. And actually, we try very hard uh, to teach those four things uh, to everybody. For, the audience, so, for example, the one thing, one of the things we do is we, see, we say, we say it the way we see it. Uh, but you don't kill in the process, right? So uh, we've taught everybody uh, to get away from passive aggressive behavior. But I will not say it because I'm a boss, I'm a junior. And so people actually just, just the ability to be able to say, I disagree. No, I don't think this is right. Uh, to actually, I just came from organizations that frankly maybe didn't do a good job of it. And I just feel it's liberating to have very junior people be able to walk in and, and say that. And of course, you agree to disagree, and you know, decisions have to be made, and you move on. I, I thought that was important, and, and we tried. You know, as an investor, does a culture, DNA, the, the talent transition, do these things come in the top five things that you keep a watch on? Definitely. Can I just go back to what sure, Sanjeev yeah, said first? But you know, even just hearing what Sanjeev said, I, I think you can sort of with hindsight try to assess culture, but even with what you said, where you said be good to people, be good to customers, right? Yeah, but, but I think those are the entrepreneurs' personal values that get translated into culture. Sorry? We don't have to have a culture strategy. Yeah. No, but I think that, that you see, in, in, in a, in a, that is culture. And in a young That's company, the culture, just, right? in a young company where you have a, a strong and genuine founder, that is what people look to. That defines culture. So there's one level you say you get McKinsey and someone to do a mission statement. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about you know, a strong founder, a, a very good guy, a genuine leader, and that defines the culture in the organization. I, I think to where we sit is, you know, culture is very, very important. And ta you know, it's talent attraction and retention. Because what we've discovered is the lost, you know, if you hire a wrong person, and then you have to, that person takes 12 months in the job, then there's another six months to hire someone else. You lose two years in that process, right? So, for me, one of the most important diligence items when we do deals is to actually go and sit at a company's location and just see what is happening. I've yet to see a successful company where there's not vibrance in the air. You know, and for example, people talk about Lilliput, which was actually turned out to be a fraud company, but when I, it was growing at 20%, but when you actually went to the company location, there was no excitement. It's very hard to be in a situation where you're growing rapidly at scale, but no one's excited, right? Similarly, this hallway, are people talking to each other, right? Or do people have closed doors? Uh, there's a lot you learn from a CEO's office when you walk in, right? If it's a massive office and their desk is totally walled, it's unlikely to be a culture where people are communicating with each other. So those are soft signals you pick up. It's very, very important because there's no way someone can tell me I'm, if you're doing a deal, I'll hire a CEO. Will that person actually hire a CEO? Will they, they let the CEO grow? You know, those are all things you have to pick up from the intangibles around you. Will you agree, Varsha, on this point? That culture perhaps is, yes, I mean, you know, it, it emanates, but it's also a lot unsaid than said. And, and, there, and there are two models that we've seen in, in, in entrepreneurs right here. I mean, you know, he believes that the culture translates from how you behave and what you do and what you say and perhaps don't say. In Shri's case, it's, it's documented. Those are the four things that we would do to make this a great place to work at. You know, I think it's a long marriage, right? Uh, being in a startup and getting to scale is a long marriage. And I think the foundation for any marriage is a set of values. Now, whether they are stated or not stated. I think in Sanju's case, they're not stated. 
but they are uh, intrinsic. They, they are now. They are now. They are now, but they were intrinsic to the group that started the, the company. In case of Suchi, it's a little bit more methodical, right? And it's, it's dated. I come from Suchi's world a little bit. Uh, you know, I grew up in Intel, and Intel, the values were always written. And that's what drove the culture. But I didn't join Intel when it was a startup. So I don't know if it existed at that time. So for me, and that was a good way of anybody who comes in knows what the company stood for. So I think in the early days, you could take the implicit uh, approach uh, or the explicit approach. But I think you need to have an approach uh, because I think that they, even the employees know what the management stands for uh, as, as a company. So I, I would vote for having a set of values. Fair point indeed. A uh, set of values that should largely be communicated or said or perhaps exemplified. But uh, Sanjeev, let's begin the round of investors. And I said I'm going to come to that early, but I'm coming to that late. What role do investors play in scaling up? And, and uh, does it help to have an investor who's patient, who's willing to wait, if it's a winning model? Uh, the truth is, uh, very often you have to wait even if it's not a winning model. Okay, so, you know, it's, it's not as if, you know, we were forced to wait. Okay. Uh, no, I'll tell you, um, what, we, what I have noticed is that, look, nine times out of ten, the entrepreneur will not listen to you. Okay, because he didn't, he didn't become an entrepreneur to look, he wasn't looking for a boss okay, when he became an entrepreneur. Whereas an investor said, do these 10 things, and he said, yes sir, yes sir. And he'll, you know, he'll humor you for a while, but you know, he'll go and do his own thing. Right? Uh, and as an investor, you have to have the maturity to first accept that. Right? Um, and that, look, the entrepreneur will do his own thing. How's the best way I can work with him, nudge him slightly here, suggest here, uh, you know, when he doesn't drop in his head, it won't drop. He won't do it. Right? If there's no buy-in from him, you can't make him do it. Okay, so so what do we do? All right, uh, we suggest, we discuss, uh, we have a beer, we you know, uh, we open our, our company. We are an operating company. Yeah. Achai, if you want to see how we do SEO, come and walk in. If you want to see how we run a call center, come and walk in. If you want to see how we do SEM, walk in uh, algorithms, analytics, you know. And sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. They pick and choose, uh, and they eventually do it their own way. And as an early stage investor, right, you got to live with that, and you got to be comfortable living with uncertainty, ambiguity, imperfect information, uh, his bright ideas, uh, you know, whatever, and and, and, and be patient. Okay, uh, you learn to live with imperfection. But before I take it to both. Uh, Neeraj and Varsha, and I'm sure they will have a different side of the story to tell as far as ambiguity and, uh, you know, impressions are concerned. But Sachi, uh, where does the pressure come from? I mean, is there, I mean, of course, there's pressure to grow the business and make it viable and, you know, in, in your case, have a profitable, repeatable unit. But does it, is there also a lot of onset pressure from investors? And does it, I mean, you know, what differentiates a good vis-a-vis -vis an impatient investor? I, I think, didn't use the uh, word bad because I've got two investors on the panel right here. No, no. I, I think every entrepreneur who seeks venture or any kind of equity needs to know that yes, it's not debt, but it has to be paid back with a return. And it is, I think, a job of the entrepreneur to make sure that your investors earn a return. I think a lot of people forget that. Uh, so I think uh, you need to remember that as an entrepreneur. Having said that, uh, so I, I can talk about my relationship with my board. Um, it is actually we have forged a way to talk so that we understand each other. And I will keep asking the same question if I don't think I've understood their perspective. Because you can tell, you know, like I'm having a chat, let's say I'm having a chat with Sanjeev and, and, and uh, Sanjeev's not on my board, but, uh, and, and he's repeating something and you know, okay, I know that you think I've not understood it, say it differently and you keep pushing the investor to explain their perspective, because it's important that you hear it. But then it's really important, and I think I, I really like that that's the board we have, is for them to then say, I know that she's heard it, and then she will go do the right thing. And then it is incumbent on the entrepreneur to come back and say, hey, you know what, I heard you, and then I went and did this bunch of thinking, and here's where I landed. And you know what? I landed at a different place. Here's why. And I think that's a good relationship. And so I think 
funds that enable that kind of conversation, typically people who enable that kind of conversation, for a company like Lime Road are great investors. But I think this whole thing about longevity and can, your, can you stay long or short, I mean, the reality is funds have life cycles, uh, they need exits, uh, it's our job to find them a way to make money. I think, you know, that, you can't hold that, uh, it's just business, right? Fair point, and that has to be paid back, but as somebody wanted to add on. Yeah, so a couple of points more. See, the truth is all young startups want capital, right? Or many of them want capital. Uh, the f fact of the matter is that, you know, the capital comes bundled along with the capitalist. Okay, you can't say I'll get capital, but oh, capitalist, no. Okay, must pass Okay, there are strings attached. You're going to sign an agreement. Uh, you'll be on a board. There'll be an 80-page SHA. There'll be a, you know, 80-page IA. They, the, the guy will have disproportionate powers. So it's really important that you get along with your investor, right? So no matter what happens, please get along with your investor and make an effort. I don't want to name companies, but yeah, you can't, you can't be on board with your investors and, <laughs> and plant stories against them. But um, Varsha and Neeraj, I want to come to you. You know, a couple of things said that uh, you have to hear out the investor, but you still have to decide because, you know, somebody who's chosen to be an entrepreneur doesn't want to be answerable to his boss. Uh, when do you draw that line? That, listen, this is my money. Uh, this is money that we put betting on your idea. But you know what? I need return on that. And I need to know whether my money is safe. And if that means that you're answerable to me, so be it. So, Priya, the reason entrepreneurs don't, should not listen to everything the investor says is not because they don't want a boss. That, you know, that may well be true. But the really important thing is you have to be held accountable for the decision you made. Sure, you sure. can't say, ye toh aapne Right. I think uh, a few points, right? One is investing is a people's business, right? You're backing people. Entrepreneurs or founding teams who look to the investor for their business plan are fundamentally flawed. So I actually agree with that, that you know, you don't have to listen to everything the investor says. Ultimate, we, we invest in a company because you're backing that management team, that CEO. What you do want is that you can have a discussion uh, about uh, certain aspects of the business or certain aspects of the management team which require tailoring, right? And what I always go with is that we are aligned from an equity perspective. If the company does well, we do well. If we do well, the founder does well, right? It's all linked together. That is the biggest motivation. We're not sitting there with a debt instrument. We're equity investors. So that creates a lot of alignment. Uh, I think that the third point I'd make is that it, you know, we have the benefit as investors of looking at many, many companies, right? And only coming back to the, the, the company you invested in once every two or three months. So you're able to look at patterns and bring the benefit of that uh, to a founding team. They might, they don't necessarily need to agree with it. That's totally fine. But you want them to assess it and analyze it and, and take what is right. And then the last point is, especially in the later stage, you look for predictability, right? You need to, what, what gives me the greatest confidence is if a management team says they'll do X, and six months later you come back and X has been done and now they're talking about Y. What gives me, by the same token, they say they're going to do X, they've done Y and X has been forgotten. That gives you some sort of queasiness at a later stage, right? So at least you have an advantage because you've seen, you've seen deliverability at a, at, at a certain stage. What about you? I mean, are you willing to live with ambiguity and imperfections that perhaps come with an, with an entrepreneurial venture? I think that's part of the business, right? We come in at early stage when we don't have the numbers. Uh, we many times haven't made our first sale uh, in the market. So it's very, very ambiguous. Um, I think that it is, uh, though it, it's a business of trust and, and people, right? Um, and all investors in India, uh, they have to be patient. It is a long, you know, it is a long cycle to an exit in India. So I would say all Indi Indian investors are patient, otherwise they wouldn't be um, in that business. For us, we have to live with ambiguity. Uh, we have to live with, you know, the business plan on which we invested is really not the business plan, even three months after we invested. So we have to be comfortable with that. As long as there is logic to the change uh, and it's what the market demands, I think you go with it right, uh, and work with it. I think it's not a boss and manager relationship. I would say it's more uh, of a collegial relationship is how I would say the board and, and the CEO is because they are bringing different perspectives to the table. One is actually executing day to day and the others, like you said, are bringing a broader perspective uh, from the market. So that's how I would view the relationship, uh, at least of the companies that I, I work with. And then I would say, yes, we are ready for the constant pivots and the constant changes till a point where we find uh, you know, our route. I think once we found it, then it's upon us to really execute and get to the next stage where it becomes more of a predictable business. Fair point. I think like someone said here, yeah, you have to be congenial with your investors. I've done 30 minutes. I've got another 10, 12 minutes for Q&A. Please raise your hands. 
Uh, do address your questions. Uh, statements can be made outside of this room. So just identify. So can we have mics go to these people? Right here, on my right. Just identify yourself and it would be great if you can direct your question to a particular person on the panel, otherwise go ahead. Hi, uh, I'm Angad. I've been an entrepreneur in the higher education space uh, for about nine years now. Um, Sanjeev sir has been a huge inspiration, not just for how you run your business, but you know, for any cash-strapped and uh, bootstrapped entrepreneur, you know, knockery always works. So my question to you is, when you uh, reach that repeatable, profitable uh, unit, uh, and you figured that 20 salespeople could get you enough free cash flows to get 20 more salespeople, right? Uh, you could have repeated that cycle on your own, right? Why did you, uh, you know, need institutional investment? And what did you tell them where you'd allocate their money? Because obviously what happened later is immaterial, you know, but no investor wants to hear that you'd put the money in an NFD. So what did you tell them? Why did you need the money? Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, we found a repeatable profitable unit maybe six to nine months after we raised money. Okay, not before. Uh, now, we raised money on April 8, 2000, market melted down just about then. Uh, we just locked up our business plan in the drawer and put the money in fixed deposit. Now, you know, I had, I had been a bootstrap for 10 years. So we knew the value of money. So we knew that we had got more money than we deserved at a valuation that we did not deserve. And we knew it was a bubble. That's being very candid. Okay. And we said, yeah, uh, so, uh, you know, and, and you know, let me tell you, so when we went out, it was the height of the bubble. And I spoke to four VCs. We didn't have an investment bank in the middle. I spoke to four VCs. We got two written term sheets, one verbal term sheet, right? All in the space of four weeks. It was that kind of bubble, right? So we knew that this is money we didn't deserve uh, at a valuation we certainly didn't deserve. And ye paisa dobara aayega nahi. Okay, so forget about it. And we just said, now how do we grow the company? Isi paise mein karna hai. Right? Uh, now, which is why we put it in fixed deposit. They said, what do we do now? And we went back to the drawing board and said, let's try a few small experiments and let's not burn too much capital on that. And which is how we did it. So we raised money for that reason. Um, yes, when you put it in fixed deposit, the investors did say, what's going on? See, jab, jab bubble burst hai na, for the first six months, people are in denial. It's a temporary correction. It'll come back. Don't worry. Oh, you know, you're believers in the bubble, right? Uh, now, we were very conservative, very risk averse. Uh, you know, we were scared and we were paralyzed with fear. And we simply said, no, this is a bubble that's burst. We know it's a bubble. And we just put the money in fixed deposit. And we built the company slowly. Okay? It took a longer time, uh, but the company got built. You have to say that you are to that. You know, I, I guess one is a statement for job security, if good companies never raise money, Varsha and I would be out of business. So, because there would be a huge reverse selection process. You know, two mistakes I've seen companies make is, one is, the best time to raise money is when it's available. Sometimes when you want to raise money, it might not be available, right? You have to keep that at the back of your mind. It doesn't mean you always keep on raising money, but you have to be a bit more opportunistic versus just thinking systematically and strategically about it. That's point one. I think point two is, you might have a repeatable uh, model which is working, but you know, there's always a, a gestation period of profitability. So to fund that, you require capital. And also by having access to capital, you can be a bit more aggressive in hiring management teams, a bit more aggressive in expanding. So there is a role for capital. It's very, I think it's very difficult at a mid-stage company to say, I'm now done with fundraising. I don't need it ever again, right? I think you get to that stage much further down the road. Uh, but remember, in India, what I found is, and Varsh and I have both invested in the U.S. as well previously, people in India tend to be much, much more dilution sensitive. I think that's a good trade to a certain degree, but beyond a certain point, it's also counterproductive to the business. And you know, you will also need some capital to make mistakes because uh, you will hire, your next 10 sales people to hire may be wrong sales people. They may not deliver. Or you may have thought it's repeatable profit, but it's not as repeatable as you thought. You know, it could be an experiment with only so many legs. Fair point. I think somebody had a question here. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, my name is Gansha Mahuja from, uh, from ThinQ8. We are the early stage investment fund. One of the questions for scaling, uh, which we see is, uh, as an entrepreneur, you don't want to lose control. You know, like, like I'm a superman, I'm doing 10 things now as a startup. Within six months, one year when I have, one is I'm looking for great guys like me. That's challenge entrepreneurs we face. And second thing is, how do I lose my control? You know, um, any suggestions from your side? How do we guide entrepreneurs? How so to so lose control? Because without that, you can't scale. Fair point. The fear of losing You know, uh, I don't know if you're married, 
<laughs> or you dated, <laughs> right? You chase the girl, you will lose control. You let her be, she'll be for you or yours. I think, I think it, it works that way. You know, the funny thing with control is, uh, you have to have control but not be controlling. Uh, the reality of this thing is that uh, depending on what business you're running, you will have, let's say, N functions. The probability that you as an entrepreneur have done all N, uh, N in depth is very low. So you would either, you know, you're a techie, you don't have sales, or you're, you're a sales guy, you don't understand tech, you've not done customer support, etc., etc. The reality is you can't do it alone. So I think, I think the faster, delusional entrepreneurship doesn't mean that you, del, it doesn't mean that you think you're Wonder Woman or Wonder Man. It just means that you're delusional about what you can build and what can be built in this market. Uh, I, think, I think it's extraordinarily important to have good people. It's extraordinarily important to have good people plus make them feel like owners. Because only then do they, you know, it's, it's, it's the thing about one person running, you know, it's like a relay. Just imagine if the front runner ran super fast and then the rest of the three runners just ran okay. Right. It doesn't work. You want all four to run amazingly well to win. So I think, I think you've got to create the conditions for that. And, and that means having systems or, or some kind of a cultural DNA or environment or process or whatever it is to make sure you know what's happening. It's important. Yeah. Uh, Neeraj is not going to give you money unless you're on top of the MIS and all lines of it. But, but the reality is you need to have every line owner feel like that they control and own and, and can exercise ownership. I think the big differentiation is between control and controlling. On the left, please, I've got four minutes on this panel. Can we just take a mic up there? We'll come to you. It's two last questions, one with the gentleman there and then the lady right here. Hi, I'm Vijay Ajmera. I'm founder of Funds Corner, which is a fintech company into SME lending. So we are at a stage where we have a running business model for last one and a half years and we are profitable on a monthly basis and we have uh, relationships going on. So they're looking to raise capital for a few reasons. We know we have to mature our product, we have to mature our risk model because it's a lending business. Now we are looking for in investors who can put in capital because this capital will help us just get more deeper relationships into the industry and not use that capital to burn. So the issue right now is we don't want to dilute right now because we know we are a profitable company. We just want some capital in the bank so that we can go into have more deeper inroads into relationships and get the model scale up. That's exactly the irony that we've spoken about. Do you want to talk on that? No, no, I don't understand. If you're not going to use the capital to, then uh, you just so, want it in the bank. Uh, so we want the capital so that we can raise debt at a better rate. We can get better relationships. Larger companies would look at our balance sheet size and say, okay, we need, say, 20, 30 crores of your balance sheet. so that No, no, one second, one second. So you, you're getting equity so that you can get debt. Yes. But you will use the debt then, right? Correct. So why did you use the equity? No, so we won't. So it's a lending model. So we want to run a profitably. I agree, but you will then use debt and equity both, right? Correct, correct. We use debt and yeah? so, so you need the money. It's not that you don't need the money. So we need very little of capital, equity capital as of now. So what's your question? So how do we reach out to those investors where we want to dilute very, uh, not significantly right now, but raise significant capital. Uh, uh, Neeraj, uh, I'm not so sure if people yeah, are willing to write those sort of checks but, in the house. You know, he wants <laughs> equity but doesn't want to dilute. No, so I'm wondering if people are willing to write lots of checks in the house. Some advice. But <laughs> if you need capital, you'll have to dilute. No, no, we don't want to dilute significantly. Because but somebody's not going to write you a blank check. That's how it works. No, no, but you're talking about getting a better valuation, no? So go to five investors, see what they say. The market will tell you, the market will tell you, A, if you can raise money, B, if so, at what valuation. The best way to discover valuation is go out in the market. If you get three offers, you know what your valuation is. Um, that's your valuation then. I mean, take it or leave it. Varsha, you want to add to that? Doesn't want to dilute, but still needs your money. Yeah. I mean, it will be tough, sir. You know, you are in a business and so are we, right? So well. I think uh, that's the way to look at it. And uh, nobody is here to give an unfair deal, at least. None of us practice oh, that, uh, practice that as, a, as a business principle. Figure out how much money you need and you know, discover the valuation in the market. There are lots of fintech companies right now in the market, so I think you know, enough of investors have looked at them. So you'll get a valuation benchmark and then figure out whether that works for you or it doesn't work for you. 
बट नो बट सीरियसली आई मीन डेक बनाओ मार्केट में जाओ पांच इन्वेस्टर से बात करो फिर पांच और से बात करो एंड यू विल गेट अ नोशन ऑफ वॉट योर वैल्यूएशन इज एंड हाउ ईगर पीपल आर टू फंड यू and if you do that you will know that's your valuation and you know you can't really fight that because that you know market will tell you so, so, right so, we will take this offline sir i want to accommodate one more question uh, sorry one very easy way of doing this is you know you want to not dilute why because you think you'll be richer and you get 100% just do the math 100% of 10 or 90% of 100 if you can go from 10 to 100 using that capital then 90 70 80 those are all good numbers to get diluted to because you are going to make more than 10 as a it, it is that end game right and so it's a, a equity stake is a number what you really want to optimize for is value absolute value and i think besides beyond the math i think like she said they're also in business and they will need something yeah, i think we'll have to take just one last question i'm reaching time but Hi, my name. My name is Neha Verma. I run Whiskers Marketing, which is a digital marketing and training company. My question is: uh, We're talking about uh, scaling through sales. Uh, in the start, of course, it's the founders who are doing the sales, but eventually, we need to have a sales team. My question is: How is there anything in particular we need to keep in mind when we are starting off with the first sales team in our company, the first four or five people that come in? Is it going to be different from the 4,000 people that eventually come? Is is the management different? Is there something we should keep in mind? So you can check that. Those yeah. So so again, no one answer that will work everywhere, but. Uh, I think in general it's a good idea to have the right blend of youth and experience. Uh it's a good idea to hire believers, you know, somebody who believes in what you're doing, who loves what you're doing, so that they'd be more passionate about it. It's a good idea for you to lead the sales team yourself and go out on sales calls yourself with the sales team so that they learn from you because usually founders are the most successful sales people, right? Uh and it's a good idea to hire enough numbers, not too many, not too few, uh, so that uh you know some will work some will not you know if you just hire two and both don't work you think sale that that model of selling is a wrong model which is maybe the incorrect conclusion maybe those are wrong sales people right and uh, it's a good idea to hire people with the right kind of ex- uh, past experience so when we were you know when when we were starting out uh, our sales team uh, we said okay uh, which is the company that does this kind of sales best and has good sales people who trains them very well right and we say okay b2b sales uh, 3 to 4 sales calls a day repeat business not just selling also servicing uh, and we figured that xerox is the best uh, model for us xerox ran the best b2b sales team and uh, and customer service team at that time and we say okay let's hire a couple of ex xerox guys to lead our sales team and so we hired two and we say okay now transplant your learnings and knowledge and hire people and train them and and lead them and that's what worked for us i hope that answers your question but i think completely out of time then it's time's up it says right here on this monitor we'll hand it over back to shivani but before that just a quick take away from the session uh scale up but remember you have to have a repeatable profitable model and also remember the investors on board are in business too and they need their return on capital so thank you very much for being a lovely audience and thanks to each one of you for being with us on this panel